Hey, thanks for tuning in to another online worship experience here at the First United Methodist Church. Whether you're joining us this morning from your home in Mount Vernon, or it's 5 o'clock somewhere and you're joining us in worship, we're thankful that you've taken this time out of your day to connect with us. You know, I was thinking this morning that one of the more noticeable and important parts of following Christ is making an effort to invest in people and stay connected with them. But during this season in our nation's history, it's, it's not the easiest to do right now, but it's just as important. So I want to encourage you this morning to uh, think of somebody you haven't talked to in a while and maybe send them a text or give them a phone call or even write them a letter just to know that you're there thinking about them. Because you know, I'm thinking of people today as well, but I don't have to look very far. If I look up, I see our amazing audio and video team working behind the scenes. So thank you, Chris Hugo, Chris Maurer, Stan Newnham, and Michael Washburn. If I look to my right, there's tons of music here with Kathy Just and Chloe Beal, and we also have some videos from the Handbell Choir and Paisley Conaway. And if I look straight ahead, we have a strong team of pastors and Reverend Gina Ellis and Reverend Victor Long. And of course, I'm thankful that I can stay connected with you guys at home. So if you are thinking of somebody to connect with today, that's great. Uh, but I want to invite you to connect your voices with ours as we join together in the hymn, God of grace and God of glory. join me in a prayer of thanksgiving. New every morning is your love, great God of light, and all day long you are working for the good in the world. Stir on us a desire to serve you, to live peacefully with our neighbors, and to devote each day to your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ the Lord. Amen. Good morning, First United Methodist Church. On Friday, June 5th, Reverend Ralph Totten, one of our retired pastors here in the church, died at the age of 89. We had a graveside service for Ralph this past Monday, June 8th, at Memorial Gardens. Ralph was a great pastor and a great human being who served a number of churches throughout southern Illinois. 
He also, uh, I learned, had a big role in getting our United Methodist camp at Little Grassy started. And he was also a trustee of McKendree University for more than 30 years, uh, something I deeply admire. We offer our love and prayers to his wife of 68 years, Jenny Totten, and to his children, Ev, Gwen, and Doug. One of the more remarkable things I learned about Ralph is that he and Jenny have 32 great-grandchildren and four great-great-grandchildren with three more on the way. So our sympathy and our love to the Totten family. There have also been several other deaths in the community uh, throughout the past week or so. We want to express our sympathy to the families of Dolly Sledge, who was the grandmother of Gabe Harrison, a uh, family of Gail Hennard, uh, the sister of Jan Steffi, and to the family of Luz Pearson. There have also been some very tragic and untimely deaths in our community due to a variety of accidents. And many of you know or are connected with these folks and their families. So we extend our prayers, our sympathy to the families of Victoria Baird, Heath Huey, and especially tragic, uh, Eli Badger, young man killed in a motorcycle accident. Let's pray for comfort and for peace in the lives of all these families. And now Ian is going to offer our morning prayer. Will you bow your heads in prayer with me? Lord, we thank you for those who have gone before us, who have begun to pave the way. You've worked through the hands and feet and voices of so many in order to bring your glory into your world. And we, when we look at the world outside today, we know there's still work to be done. We ask that you prepare us and use us for the work to come. May we be instruments of peace and justice. Help us to do all the good we can, by all the means we can, in all the places we can, at all the times we can, to all the people we can, for as long as we can. We ask that your spirit guides us and your love strengthens us. We pray that we are brought into new relationships with people that we don't understand, and that despite our differences, your love and sacrifice might just make us one. We thank you for choosing to save us all, despite who we are. We thank you for using us all, despite who we are. And we thank you for teaching us all to pray this prayer together, despite who we are. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
In Luke's Gospel, chapter 3, verse 11, we read that if one man has two shirts, they should share with someone who has none. And if somebody has food, they should do the same. Now, in our global situation, I don't suggest sharing shirts or even sharing food. But here at the church, if you want to follow in the footsteps of the devoted who came before you uh, and follow in the words of Luke, we have plenty of ways to do that. You can hop on to giving.mountvernonfirst.org. Uh, you can text 844-909-1077. Just put in the dollar amount with no decimal. And you can always mail us here at the church at 1133 Main Street. We also ask that you take a second to click on the link below the video so you can fill out your attendance. Go ahead and share any prayer requests you may have, or if you're feeling a little lonely, you can always just say hi. We love you guys, and we miss you too, and we're thankful that we can work together to make our community a better place. Hi, happy Sunday. I hope you're all doing great this morning. I just wanted to talk to you this morning about something that I read somewhere a long time ago, and I think I heard it in a sermon Victor preached, and I think I may have heard it at a thing I attended called Emmaus Walk. Uh, it's a story about a church in World War II in France, and the church was totally destroyed by some bombs that were dropped on it. Now, after the bombings had stopped, the church members went into their church and they found a statue of Christ with his hands out like this, still standing, but a beam had fell and the hands were broken off. Well, that story intrigued me, and so I tried to find out more about it. Now, the church people, <coughs> excuse me, the church people tried to find someone who could fix the hands and put them back on. And so they found a, a sculptor, someone who did statues. And he tried and tried and tried to put those hands back on. And he just couldn't make them look right. They never could look right. And so finally, they just gave up and they put a plaque at the bottom that just said, Jesus has no hands here on earth except yours or something to that effect. Um, and I thought, that's really a neat story. So I started looking and trying to find out more about it. And what I found out was there's a story like that about a church in Germany, a story like that about a church in France, and one about a church in a village in Africa. And then there's even another one about a Catholic church in San Diego, California. <clears throat> Now that statue really does exist outside of the church, and I even found a picture of it. But the hands were broken off by some people that wanted to hurt the church. And it wasn't a bomb or anything like that. And instead of repairing the hands, the people of the church put a plaque up that said, I have no hands but yours. And that is a reference to a poem by St. Teresa of Avila that says, or begins with, Christ has no body now on earth but yours, no hands but yours, no feet but yours. Now that statue, like I said, still there, and it still has no hands on it. I don't know the true story behind that statue of Christ without hands, but I love what it means. <clears throat> And I love the fact that the story's told to remind us that it's not just enough to pray for God to help someone else. What it means is sometimes we need to be the answer to prayers ourselves, that it's up to us to help our neighbors. And who is our neighbor? It's anyone we meet. It may be even someone we've never met, possibly someone on the other side of the world. But sometimes we're the only people God has to do the work. So sometimes it's up to us to be Jesus Christ to those people. So this week, find somebody that you can be Christ to and love them. Okay? All right. 
I look forward to seeing you guys as soon as possible. Bye. Good morning, everyone, or good evening, if that's when you happen to be watching. If I remember correctly, we last gathered for worship in this sanctuary on March 15th, right at three months ago. Can you believe it? Today marks the 13th week that we have brought worship to you via the Internet. And I don't know about you, but it still seems kind of unreal to me. Now, it looks as if the state will transition to phase four of the Restore Illinois plan on Friday, June 26th, if nothing major changes. That means we could, we could have worship here in the sanctuary again on Sunday, June 28th, which happens to be John Wesley's birthday. However, and there's always a however, we can only do so with an abundance of safeguards and caution, which our bishop tells us we must follow. If it looks good for June 28th, then next Sunday, the 21st, I will go over those guidelines with you in worship, and then we'll follow up with a letter. But for example, you will need to wear a mask to worship. Like it or not, that's for everyone's health and safety. Uh, we will not be able to sing or recite out loud anything in the service. Uh, we will have to be spaced out and I'm, by that I mean distanced in the sanctuary, and limited to no more than 100 in each worship service. We will have offering plates available, but we will not be passing the offering plate. Uh, we will not be able to have children's church at this point. Uh, we will have a children's message, but the kids cannot gather together at the front of the sanctuary. Uh, we can't hug, shake hands, or touch one another. Now the list goes on. And hopefully, phase four will pass quickly. Nonetheless, if it's looking good for June 28th, I'll talk about it in next Sunday's worship service, and then we'll follow up with a first-class letter to your home. And just to remind you, we will continue to live stream the services when we resume worship. So if you are not yet comfortable coming to church, you are encouraged to continue participating in that way. We're very thankful to have that technology. Thanks again for your patience and your faithfulness during this very challenging and unique time in history. I also wanted to say a quick word about something else. Uh, last night, uh, my wife and I watched a movie uh, titled Just Mercy. It is free this month on Amazon Prime, and it is gut-wrenching and eye-opening, and it tells a true story. And given uh, all the talk about uh, racial injustice in our land, uh, it's, it would be worth watching if you have Amazon Prime, just mercy. This morning's gospel is from Matthew, where we find this. 
Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful. But the laborers are few, therefore ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Then Jesus summoned his twelve disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to cure every disease and every sickness. These are the names of the twelve apostles. First, Simon, also known as Peter, and his brother Andrew. James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon the Cananean, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles, And enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim the good news, the kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You received without payment, so give without payment. The gospel of the Lord. Would you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. It is a movie from 1980 that has become a cult classic. Yes, I know my sermon illustrations are starting to get a little dated, but uh, that's because of my age. The premise of the movie is this. See if you remember it. After being released from prison, a man joins his brother in a quest to raise $5,000 to save the orphanage in which they were raised from closing due to back taxes owed. One synopsis describes the plot in this way. The two are convinced they can earn the money by getting their old band back together. However, after playing several gigs and making a few enemies, including the Chicago police, the brothers face daunting odds to deliver the money on time. Well, you may recall those two brothers as Jake and Elwood, the Blues Brothers, played by Dan Aykroyd and John Belushi. And in that movie, whenever asked why they're doing what they're doing, they answer with that memorable line, we're on a mission from God. We're on a mission from God. Do you remember that? If you do, you're probably old like me, and it seems impossible that the Blues Brothers came out 40 years ago. The question I'd like to ask you this morning is simply this. Are you on a mission from God? Are you doing God's work right here and right now, work to which God calls you and empowers you and even gives you the authority to do? Are you on a mission from God? The gospel today is really rich. Matthew begins by telling us how Jesus has been traveling through cities and villages, teaching in the synagogues, and proclaiming the good news of God's kingdom. Matthew says that people gravitated toward Jesus in great numbers, and and Jesus cured every disease and sickness. Verse 36 is a wonderful and insightful verse, and it's one of my favorites in the Gospels. Matthew says, When Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion for them, because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. When Jesus looked at all these people who were gathering around him, seeking him out, people who were sick and hurting and afraid, What did Jesus experience? Compassion. Jesus had compassion for these hurting people who were coming to him. 
I've told you before, in Greek, the word for compassion literally refers to the gut. Jesus felt this compassion deeply within himself. Why did he feel this compassion? Because he saw folks who were harassed and helpless. They were lost and aimless. They were like sheep without a shepherd. Now, most Bible commentaries I read view this as a slam against the religious establishment of Jesus' day. Either the people are being led astray by their religious leaders or there is simply a failure of leadership. Jesus had compassion for hurting people because they were harassed and helpless. They were like sheep without a shepherd with no one to guide them, no one to care for them. Jesus then issues an appeal for help in the work that he's doing. He declares, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. The New Living Translation puts it this way. The harvest is great, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest. Ask him to send more workers into his fields. You see, Jesus is looking for help in his work of gathering people into God's kingdom. Jesus is looking for people who will extend his compassion to those who are hurting. Jesus is looking for folks like you and me who will join him in the work of proclaiming God's kingdom and giving help and hope to those who are lost and afraid. Chapter 10 opens by telling us that Jesus calls together the 12 disciples. And, and the gospel says, listen to this, that Jesus gave them authority over unclean spirits, to cast them out and to cure every disease and every sickness. Isn't that remarkable? Jesus gives these, these 12 disciples who were ordinary people like you and me the authority to do what He Himself has been doing. Then Matthew goes on to list the 12 by name. Only in this instance, He refers to them as apostles, rather than disciples. Do you know what an apostle is? Quite simply, an apostle is, is one who is sent. Synonyms might be delegate, ambassador, or messenger. An apostle is someone who is sent on a mission for someone else. Jesus then tells them exactly what that mission will include. He says, As you go, proclaim the good news of God's kingdom, Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You have received freely, now freely give to others. My brothers and sisters, believe it or not, that same invitation, that same mission isn't limited to those first 12 apostles. Jesus is asking for your help today. Jesus is wanting to use you to impact the lives of others in ways that are life-giving, if not life-changing. Jesus gives you authority, authority to share His healing love and to extend His, His great compassion to those who feel banged up by life. What do you think about that? Are you on a mission from God? Retired Bishop Will Williman recalls seeing a billboard at the edge of a town where he once lived, which advertised a local church. The billboard said, We've got what you want. Come and get it. The thinking behind this, Williman says, is obvious. The church is where you come seeking, wanting, shopping for something you want. The church exists to meet your needs, answer your questions, solve your problems, and respond to your wants. But Williman offers this critique, saying, trouble is, there's very little in Scripture that supports this supermarket image of the church. What if the church isn't the means whereby you get what you want out of God, 
but rather the place where God gets what God wants out of you. What if Christian discipleship isn't the way God meets your needs, but rather you are the way that God meets the world's needs? Do you hear that? What if Christian discipleship isn't the way God meets your needs, but rather you are the way that God meets the world's needs? I loved the message of the song that Ashley Hugo sang in last week's worship service, a song titled Do Something by Matthew West. Do you remember that? It begins, I woke up this morning, saw a world full of trouble now. I thought, how do we ever get so far down and how's it ever going to turn around? So I, I turned my eyes to heaven. I thought, God, why don't you do something? Well, I just couldn't bear the thought of people living in poverty and children sold into slavery. The thought disgusted me, so I shook my fist at heaven and said, God, why don't you do something? And the chorus begins saying this. He said, I did. I created you. My brothers and sisters, let me ask you again. Are you on a mission from God? Honestly, my friends, after watching or listening to the news, I can get as negative about the world as much as anyone else. But the funny thing is, if the world is going to change for the better, it requires our effort and our participation. If we want God to transform our hatred into love and and change our animosity into respect for one another, it begins with you and me. Letting God use you and me to speak and act in ways that are just and loving and peace-filled. Are you on a mission from God? I deeply admire the work of Father Gregory Boyle in Los Angeles. Father Greg is a Jesuit priest who in 1986 was sent to serve the poorest Catholic parish in Los Angeles. The parish included the largest public housing projects west of the Mississippi and the highest concentration of gang activity in the nation, if not the world. Father Greg quickly grew weary of burying so many young adults who'd been killed in senseless acts of gang violence. And where others only saw criminals, Father Greg saw people, human beings who were in need of help. So in 1988, he started an organization called Homeboy Industries which has engaged and transformed more than 120,000 gang members by providing love, hope, jobs, and education to these young adults. Homeboy Industries has evolved into the largest gang intervention, rehab, and reentry program in the world. I could go on and on about all the good they do, but the testimonies of those who've been transformed are important. One young man, Vance Webster, a former member of the Crips gang and uh, once imprisoned as an accessory to murder, says this, The gift that Father G has given us is that he sees the best in all of us. He loves us. He tells you that he loves you. He tells you he's proud of you. This dude is a remarkable human being. Another young man first encountered Father Greg when he was in juvenile hall. He says, I remember the first time he ever told me he loved me. To me, it was like uncomfortable because I'm here looking at him like, man, how's this white man going to tell me he loves me when not even my own mom tells me that? But he just started showing me how to love and how to be loved. Again, I could go on and on. But the point is that Greg Boyle saw a need, a human need. He saw people who were 
who are harassed and hurting, people who were lost and aimless. And he responded to it with love and with the authority of Jesus Christ. And it has transformed a community and the lives of countless human beings. How is God calling you to change the world with God's love? Maybe not the whole world, but most certainly your little piece of the world that you live in. How is God wanting to use you to impact the lives of other people in ways that are life-giving and could be life-changing? Will you join Jesus in His mission of curing the sick, raising the dead, cleansing lepers, and confronting and casting out all the evil that is around us? My brothers and sisters, are you on a mission from God. I was on Twitter this past week. I may be spending too much time on Twitter. And I came across someone who posted a quote they attributed to N.T. Wright, uh, who is a well-known Bible scholar and a bishop in the Church of England. And Wright says this, When God wants to change the world, He doesn't send in the tanks. He sends in the poor in spirit, the meek, the humble, the brokenhearted, the mourners, the hungry for justice, the peacemakers. They are the ones through whom the world gets changed. One final time, let me ask. Are you on a mission from God? Let us pray. It is so easy, gracious God, to grow bitter and cynical about the state of our world. Yet we hear Jesus' continued call to join Him in His mission of healing broken lives, of confronting evil, of restoring hope, of transforming our communities and our world with the light of Your love. Fill us, God, with that same compassion for this hurting world and use us to answer the needs of those around us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now let us close by singing a hymn that is a favorite to a lot of us. Here I am, Lord.
This service is ended, but our life in God goes on and on. May your faith be so real and your joy so obvious that all who see you will come to praise God. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, let us go and live in God's great love and peace. Amen. Amen.